Good morning. Uh, JR already asked you if you had any leftovers. I'm not sure if he's thinking about going from house to house and uh, scooping those up or not, what his plan was in as asking that question. But uh, after uh, Thanksgiving, I always like to sing a little song. I don't know if you know it. It goes like this. <clears throat> Filled to overflowing, oh, my belly showing. That's all the words I put together so far, but uh, <coughs> I'm, working on an, I'm working on the second verse, so if you have any ideas, open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Philippians chapter 2. And uh, today we're going to have a great milestone. We're going to finish chapter 2 of the book of Philippians. Uh, somebody said to me not too long ago, if you're going to finish the book of Philippians, you're probably going to have to be here for another two or three years at the rate you're, uh, the rate you're going through it. But I, uh, I don't know if you've enjoyed it, but I certainly, uh, I certainly have. Uh, <clears throat> this morning we're going to, uh, as we look at the book of Philippians this morning, we're going to uh, talk about uh, how important one man was and the work that he, do, the work that he has done in the, the church. And, uh, you know, sometimes when we stop and think about church, we think of church as, well, that's the place that I go on Sunday for uh, an hour or so and uh, uh, sort of get a, a spiritual meal out of the things and uh, stuff like that. But church is so much more than that. And we're going to see that this morning. And not only is it so much more than that, but there's so much more to it. Uh, being involved in it, being a part of church, than just uh, being here on a uh, on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or a Wednesday night, those kinds of uh, those kinds of things. And uh, so this morning, that's what we're going to talk about in light of uh, a man by the name of Epaphroditus. So this morning, we're going to look at Epaphroditus as a model for our service in the, the Church of Jesus Christ. So before we get started, let's uh, talk to God, and then we'll look at the scriptures. Our Heavenly Father, we uh, come to you today with uh, great rejoicing as we think of this uh, past week as our, uh, a day that we set aside for Thanksgiving. And uh, I pray God for uh, each one of us as believers that that would not be the only time that we give thanks, but Thanksgiving to you would be uh, part of our uh, daily or even moment by moment exercise as we walk through the day and see your hand uh, upon each and every situation that goes on in our lives. and. We thank you, Father, that uh, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have this wonderful gift of salvation, and we just rejoice uh, in that. We thank you for that, and, and we just pray, God, that you would to continue to use us in the hearts and lives of other people that are uh, uh, still in need of the, the Savior. And as uh, J.R. mentioned about uh, praying for all the missionaries that are all over the, the world, uh, sharing the good news of Jesus, and just pray, Father, as uh, some of them may be even having a, a service right now, that you would uh, bless them and challenge them and encourage them in their uh, service for you. And uh, God, that there would be much fruit and glory because of... Uh, their, their ministry and their service to, uh, to you, dear God. And, and for each one of us here, Father, you know uh, we come with uh, some with uh, joyous, rejoicing hearts and, and some with uh, heavy hearts uh, because of things that are going on in life. And we just pray, dear God, for you to uh, uh, encourage us through the preaching of your word this morning, encourage us through the, the blessings of Scripture. And, and I ask, Heavenly Father, to, for you to speak to each one of us, God, and uh, uh, allow us to be different people that we walk, that walk out of here than the people that walked in and that uh, you would make those uh, changes in our life that you want us to make because, uh, God, our desire is to, uh, to be uh, like the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we know that we have a, a long way to go and we need you to, uh, to do that work of sanctification in us to, to bring us to that place. But God, just uh, maybe change us a little bit today. Thank you, Father, for uh, the blessings of uh, the Word of God. Thank you for the blessings of singing. Thank you for the blessings of praying. And we just uh, worship you and praise you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. 
In the book of uh, Philippians uh, chapter 2, if you remember, we have uh, worked our way through uh, this chapter, and the chapter is uh, really has the idea of being uh, other-centered, has the idea of uh, serving other people, has the idea of humili humiliating ourselves or humbling ourselves so that we can exalt other people, so that we can minister to other people, that, that we can be the servants that, uh, you know, that God uh, wants us to be in the, in the servants for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we We've talked about how Jesus uh, humbled himself, and we talked about uh, how Timothy uh, humbled himself. And so this morning we're going to talk about uh, another man by the name of Epaphroditus. And we're in uh, chapter 2 and verse uh, 25. We're going to go through from 25 through the end of the chapter. And uh, when we're talking about this guy by the name of Epaphroditus, uh, Philippians 2.25 is where we're going to start. When we talk about this uh, man, Epaphroditus, uh, Philippians is the only place that uh, he is mentioned in the scriptures. Uh, you don't see him any other place. Uh, Paul doesn't make mention of him in any of any of his other books. And and apparently, uh, what we know about Epaphroditus is he was a, a member of the the church. Uh, he was a part of the church at Philippi. That the apostle Paul was there. He ministered. He started the church. And you know, we talked about all those things at the beginning of this series. But he was a, a member, a part of this church. And and uh, the church at Philippi, their desire was to uh, to help Paul. Paul was in Rome and uh, uh, in prison in. Rome and the church at Philippi wanted to help him. And so they sent Epaphroditus there to, uh, to minister to Paul, to give him a gift, to, uh, to help him out, to do whatever he, uh, whatever he could. And so uh, Paul make, makes mention of him in, uh, in chapter 2 and beginning at verse, uh, verse 25. So we really don't know very much about Epaphroditus, but we're going to see some interesting things about him and his service to, uh, uh, to God and to the Apostle Paul. So verse, 70, uh, verse 25 says, he says, Yet I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. Now, notice what he says, Epaphroditus, my brother. Now, you realize that in the, the church... Of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever we have been born into the family of God, everybody else who has been born into the family of God is a brother or a sister of yours. You're related because you have been born into the family of God. You've been adopted to, into the family of God. Some churches have a, a practice where they call one another, you know, brother or sister kind of, uh, kind of thing. Just thinking about the, uh, the relationship that goes on there. And so when you're thinking about being a, a, part, of a, a part of a church, when you're thinking about being a, a, a member or a tender of a church, whenever you come together, you realize that you're coming together with people that are brothers and sisters. Now, uh, <clears throat> some people don't have any brothers and sisters and, you know, maybe have a little bit of a struggle uh, grasping this concept. But all of us who have uh, brothers and sisters that maybe we grew up with, we know that being a brother or being a sister, uh, that's a challenge. Right, Larry? Yeah, see, Larry knows, and if you don't, uh, if you don't believe me, you ask Larry after we're done. Being a being a brother is a is a challenge. Why? Why is it? You know, why is it so challenging? Well, whenever you're growing up, uh, you're struggling with, uh, you know, who's going to be the favorite son or the favorite daughter. Uh, you're fighting over who's going to get uh, uh, the toys. You're fighting over, uh, you know, who gets to go first and things and all that kind of stuff. And then whenever you grow up, you become adults. Then you have a whole different relationship with that brother and sister. You know, it's somebody that you look out for. It's somebody that you care for. Somebody that you're interested in. Somebody that you want to, you know, you want to help. Somebody Somebody that you uh, you know you want to see them be a su be successful and you and you care about what's going on with uh, with them and it's the same idea and that's why I think that Paul uses this uh, illustration here and why he uses this thought of be about being brothers that here is Epaphroditus you know he is my brother in the, in the things of the of the Lord he is my brother. In service, you know, Paul didn't look at himself as saying, "Hey, look at me! I'm an apostle. I'm up here, and everybody else, you know, Timothy and Epaphroditus and all those other guys are down here." He said, "No, we're on equal plane. We're on equal footing. We're, you know, we're brothers and sisters in the in the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're brothers and sisters in our relationship with uh, with one another." And as I was thinking about, uh, you know, being brothers and sisters, as I was uh, uh, thinking about this past week, I thought to myself, you know, whenever you have a, a brother or a sister, you want them to to succeed, you want them to be successful, you want them to, uh, you know, to, to flourish, you know, you don't spend your time, you know, criticizing them, 
You don't spend your time, you know, tearing them down. You don't spend your time making fun of them. I mean, you did whenever you're young, right? But, you know, once you become mature, once you become an adult, you know, your desire, your, your passion is to, to help them, to, to minister to them, you know, to be a blessing to, uh, to them, you know, to stay in touch with them. And I, and I hear uh, different people that talk about the fact that, you know, they haven't talked to their brother or their sister in a, in a long period of time, you know, sometimes many, uh, many years. And I say, wow, that's, that's really sad that you don't have that, you know, that close communication, that you don't touch base. Now, I don't, I don't talk to my, I have two sisters, and I don't talk to them every week, but, uh, you know, every couple of weeks, we, you know, we talk on the phone and, you know, share what's going on with my family and her family, and, and we care about what's going on, and we send prayer requests back and forth, and, you know, those kinds of things with the idea of, you know, being brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's the same thing in the church. Whenever you walk into a church and you're part of a church, you know, those other people in the church, they are your brothers and sisters. They are your family of God. And so how do you treat them? Well, you don't try to tear them down. You don't try to, you know, to uh, discourage them, but you lift them up and you help them and you try to be a blessing to them and, and you want them to be successful. You want them to, uh, you know, to be victorious in their Christian life and you, you encourage them in the, in the things of God. And this is, I think, uh, the picture here that Paul was making. Here's this Epaphroditus. He came from, uh, from Philippi to Rome to be a blessing to me. And he did that. One of the reasons he did that is because we are brothers and sisters in the family of God. You know, we're part of this, uh, this whole thing of uh, uh, God's work and God's body and what God is doing in the, in the world today. And he's my brother. And so when we look at this, uh, this concept, this thought here, Paul refers to him. He says, he is my, he is my brother. He's somebody who cares about me. He's somebody who's interested in me. He wants, uh, you know, he wants my best and I want his best also. Now, notice he doesn't stop there in verse 25 and stop and just say, well, he's my brother. But he says, Epaphroditus, my brother. And he says, and he's also my companion in labor. Okay. My companion in labor. Now, it doesn't talk at all, the scripture doesn't talk at all about what Epaphroditus did whenever he went to Rome. Most commentators say that probably he got to Rome, he was able to give the, the gift to Paul, uh, the monies or the, you know, the, the needs that Paul had, and probably he got sick, and then we're going to read along a little bit later, where it talks about he probably sent him back to Philippi rather quickly because of how he was feeling and because of what was going on with the people there. And so probably Probably he wasn't ministering with Paul in Rome. Probably he's referring back to whenever they were in Philippi that they were ministering. They were working together. They were uh, ministering uh, companions in labor back in the, in the city of uh, Philippi. Now, think about that for a second. Uh, Whenever we have somebody that we are uh, that we are working with, okay, somebody who has a you know a job, somebody who is a co-labor with you, you know, you sometimes or many times you get you know you get to be pretty close friends. You get uh, you know to to have a, a good relationship because you know you're working together. You're trying to accomplish something, and and uh, you know you need to pull your end of the the load, and they need to pull their end of the load, and and when you get that going together, uh, you know things go pretty well. Now when you just have somebody who's a, a co-labor who doesn't hold up their end of the, the bargain, that's, you know, very difficult. But when you have somebody who is a co-labor, somebody who's working hard, like you're working hard, you get to know them. You know, you get to see their, you know, their passion. You get to see their, uh, you know, their abilities and their skills and their talents that they have. And, and you get to see what, uh, what things are going on. And you can set aside a lot of differences that you might have in your personality because, hey, we're, you know, we're working towards this goal. We want to accomplish this, this, this labor. And it's the same thing true in the church of Jesus Christ, right? And we look around the room here, we all have different personalities, right? You know, some people are very, you know, serious and, and uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, on task all the time. And, and other people are sort of, you know, light and, you know, sort of, uh, you know, fun kind of people. And, and other people are, you know, just a little on the grouchy side from time to time. And, and then there are other people that are, you know, just happy all the time. And we have these different kinds of, you know, personalities in, in, the, in the church of Jesus Christ. And God has brought us together. But as co-laborers, we can sort of set those kind of things together and say, well, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that person, you know, they're, they're, they get a little grouchy sometimes, but, but that's okay. You know, we're working together and we're going to, you know, we're going to accomplish this goal. And what is the goal? You know, the church of Jesus Christ basically has three goals. <clears throat> one is to, <clears throat> excuse me, one is to see unsaved people come to know Christ. 
Number two is to help those people that, that know the Lord Jesus Christ to grow and develop and mature in the, in the body of Christ. And number three is to worship the Lord. Okay, so, you know, we're working together, you know, this body of Christ working together to sort of do those three different things, to do those three different tasks so that the Lord Jesus would be glorified, so people can be saved, and so that people can grow in their relationship with, uh, with God. And so we can set those things aside and we're co laborers You know, that's what we want to accomplish. And how do we do that? Well, we do that through, you know, stuff like Sunday school. And we do that through, you know, evangelism. We do that through having worship services and all of those kinds of things. And we involve ourselves. We're co-laborers. We're all in these together, okay? And the thing that we need to recognize is that, you know, whenever we come to a church, we're part of a church that it's not just, you know, the preacher and the deacons, you know, their responsibility to do things. We're all co-laborers in this thing called the church because what's he talk about? He talks about the church being the body of Christ. Now think about this for a second. If one part of your body isn't functioning, okay, one part of your body, uh, you know, gets hurt. One part of your body, uh, you know, is just, uh, you know, Say you, uh, you're playing basketball and you stove your, your finger. You know how it is when you stove it, you know, the basketball hits that thing and the thing, you know, blows up about that big, okay? And every time you turn around, you know, you go to use that finger and say, ooh, ah, and you go to eat something. Oh, I can't, you know, I can't bend my finger. Or you go to, you know, work on the computer and, wow, I can't type anything. And it seems like the whole world is wrapped around that one finger that's not working, Right? And that's just the way it is when something doesn't work. And it's the same thing is true in the body of Jesus Christ, that all of the parts of the body need to work together as co-laborers to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish, to do this work of evangelism, to do this work of, of growth or discipleship, to do this work of worship. We need all of us to be working together. And so Paul says, you know, here's Epaphroditus. He's a, he's a co-worker. He's somebody who is, he jumped into the, to the ministry and he was involved in what was taking place. And so he was a co-laborer. So whenever he looks at Epaphroditus and said, you know, Epaphroditus, you know, he wasn't somebody who just sat on the sidelines and said, why aren't you doing it this way? And why aren't you doing it this way? And that's the way I wanted to do it over here. And to be grouchy and that kind of thing. He jumped in and he did work and he was a co-laborer in the things of Christ. Let's go on. He didn't stop there. Paul goes on talking about him in verse 25. Not only, he says, was he a brother and a companion in the labor, a co-laborer, but he was also a fellow soldier. Woo, boy, this is where it gets fun, right? A fellow soldier. Turn over, if you would, to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. And many times we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't take this seriously or we don't recognize what's going on in the world around us, okay? Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul talks about uh, the battle that we are in, okay? Let's start reading in verse number 10, Ephesians 6.10. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay, what's he saying? He says, you know, put this armor on because the devil is going to, to do something. The devil is desirous to, uh, you know, to, to make you fall. The devil is desirous to make you stumble. The devil is desirous to, uh, you know, to, to ruin your testimony for Christ. The devil has this desire. Notice what he says in verse uh, 12. He says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand in that evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins. And he's going to go down through the rest of it. But the, the point is that he's saying, you know, here we are that we're fellow soldiers. Why are we fellow soldiers? Because we're in a, in a battle, in a battle. Battle against whom? Against a battle against, you know, spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, the devil, you know, he talks about then Peter, he says, the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now you realize that when he's talking about devouring him, you know, the devil doesn't want to eat you and I, right? 
He doesn't look at us as a Thanksgiving turkey and say, you know, I want to eat you, I want to devour you. The idea is that he wants you to fall and stumble. He doesn't want you to be successful in your Christian life of helping people to grow and helping people to get saved and of worshiping the Lord. He doesn't want you to be successful there. He wants you to live in sin and misery and to tear down the, Jesus, uh, the name of Jesus Christ, to be a hypocrite in the church. You know, that's his desire. And he says, we wrestle against him. We, we, are, we are fellow soldiers in this battle against the things that Satan is trying to do in the world. And we are trying to be that light of the world so that people can know and love Jesus Christ and develop in him. Turn over, if you would, to the book of uh, 2 Timothy. Peter, I mean, Paul says it a little bit differently in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, talks about this, uh, this warfare that we are involved in. 2 Timothy chapter uh, 2 and verse 3. 2 Timothy 2, 3. Notice what uh, Paul says here. 2, 3 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now just think about that for a second. Endure hardness. Now, I don't know about you, but I like to do things the easy way. Right? Right? I like to do things the, you know, that doesn't take this much time and, and effort and, and isn't as big of a challenge to me. I like to, to do things the easy way. But here what's he saying? He says to endure hardness as a soldier of Jesus Christ. My uh, son, as some of you know, he is in the, he's in the Army. And uh, he was in uh, Bible college whenever he uh, enlisted in the, the National Guard. And he went off to... Uh, Someplace in Kentucky, I forget it, around Louisville, someplace they have a, a, a camp there. And so he went there for, uh, for basic training. So we had seen him, my wife and I, we had seen him before he went to basic training. And then uh, we went to his basic training graduation. And it was just unbelievable, the difference in him. You know, I don't think he was any smarter, but boy, he certainly looked a lot different. You know, he wasn't, uh, you know, sort of... Yeah, maybe just a little bit chubby, we'll call him. Man, he wasn't that at all. Man, he was, you know, rock solid and he was ready to go and, and he was in shape. And uh, <clears throat> so I didn't ask him because I already knew the answer. I didn't say to him, you know, have you been sitting around the lounge drinking milkshakes every day? You know, just resting up and getting ready to go? No, he said, we were, you know, we're, we're working out and we're training and we're going hikes and we're, you know, carrying packs around and we're doing obstacle course. You know, we're doing, we're doing all of these hard things because why? Because we're soldiers of the United States of America. And it's the same idea. We don't have to be physically in shape. We don't have to be physically, well, I mean, it's certainly good to do that, but you know, that's not the requirement. God wants us to be spiritually in shape. God wants us to be spiritually rock solid because we are fellow soldiers. You know, we're, we're part of one another. We're, we're, uh, we're taking care of one another. And so he says, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And notice what verse 4 says. No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that you may please him who hath chosen you to be a soldier. Okay. He says, you know, you're, you're not entangling yourself with this life. And that's one of the plagues upon the church of Jesus Christ as we get so worried about what's going on here. Uh, you know, some people talk about, you know, being so heavenly minded and you know earthly good. I think many times in the church we're so earthly minded that we're no heavenly good. We need to realize that, you know, this world isn't our home. This isn't where we're going to spend eternity. We're, we're soldiers for the king. And, and what we do here is just, you know, getting ready as preparation for whenever we get to glory to be with him, that we're, we're soldiers of Jesus Christ. There's a battle that's going on. And if the Satan can, you know, blind us to the fact that we're in the midst of this battle, then we'll just sort of walk around and say, well, you know, uh, sort of last a days ago and not, not, with a purpose of growing and maturing and developing in our spiritual life, not with a purpose of seeing people get saved. And we're not those soldiers that God wants us to be. But he says, you know, Epaphroditus, he was a good soldier. He was a fellow soldier. He didn't entangle himself with the things of this world. He was seeking to minister. He was seeking to be the servant. He was seeking to be the one that was pleasing God, pleasing the one who had called him. You know, like he says here in, uh, in 2 Timothy, he's not entangling himself with the things of this world because he wanted to please him, please God who had called him to service. And we need to think about that. 
You know, when I, again, so many times when we think about, you know, well, I'm going to go to, to this church because, uh, you know, there's music there that I like, or I'm going to go to this church because there's a, a pastor there that I like to hear. I'm going to go to this church because, uh, you know, for some other reason, recognize that, you know, the church is a body that we're there to, to, as soldiers, we're there as brothers and sisters in Christ, we're there to, you know, to, to minister. We're going to talk about that in just, uh, just a moment here. Let's go back to uh, the book of Philippians chapter, uh, chapter 2. Paul says, Epaphroditus, he's my brother, my companion in labor. He's my fellow soldier, he says, but he's your messenger. Now, the word messenger, I don't know if you uh, uh, know this, but the word messenger is also translated uh, apostle. And it's the idea of uh, uh, somebody who, uh, you know, has the message. When you think about the apostles, you think about God giving the apostles the, uh, the message to deliver to the church of Jesus Christ for them to, you know, to grow and mature and develop in the, in the, for the church to, to move forward. But the idea of the apostle here is that some translators, some interpreters, some people that, uh, you know, are a lot more smarter in Bible things than I am, have the idea or a thought that, you know, maybe he's talking to Epaphroditus here and saying, you know, Epaphroditus is, you know, one of the, one of the apostles. But, you know, he's never mentioned any place else in Scripture and those kind of things. And so I think a better understanding is the way the King James translates it here, that he's your messenger, Okay. Here is the Paul, the, here is Epaphroditus that he is taking this message from Philippi and he's taking it to Rome and along with the, the gift so that Paul can be encouraged and, and be blessed. And in the, the ministry that we're, uh, that we're involved in, in the, uh, the ministry of the church, we are God's messengers, right? The Lord Jesus was the light of the world while he was here. But once he left the world, he left us here to be the light of the world. He left us here so that we could be messengers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that people could hear the gospel message and recognize that uh, they are lost and put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, you are, you are messengers, okay? And again, some, so many times when we think about, you know, church is just, uh, you know, this place that I visit and I'm part of on, on, uh, on Sunday mornings for a little while or Sunday nights for a little while. But being that... A messenger is, a, you know, it's a lifelong commitment of, you know, everybody that I come in contact with, you know, they're, I come in contact with them for a purpose so I can influence them in the things of Jesus Christ. So I can be an encouragement to them in the things of Jesus Christ. You know, the, uh, we sang uh, that song. It was, it was pretty neat and it really ties in with the, uh, with the service. He says, I saw Jesus in you. And you think about that for a second. When people see us, when people have a, uh, a, a conversation with us, when people have interaction with us, do they see Jesus in us? Not physically, but spiritually. You know, the words that come out of our mouth, the attitudes that we have. You know, do they see the Lord Jesus Christ in us? That's the idea of being a messenger of God. Another place over in the book of... Uh, 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul talks about us being ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're his representatives while we're here on this, uh, this earth. And that's all part of, again, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are specific messengers of Jesus Christ to tell other people that they're lost on their way to hell. But Jesus Christ can be their Savior, give them life that lasts forever. And that's what he's referring to here when he talks about being this messenger of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go on. He didn't stop there yet. He says, a fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my need. He is a minister. Now, I realize that uh, whenever the world uses this word minister, they're usually talking about somebody like me who uh, preaches, who does funerals, who does weddings and say, you know, a minister. I remember back whenever I was in uh, elementary school, no, grade school, maybe fifth or sixth grade, this, my Sunday school teacher, she said to me, Joe, you ought to be a minister whenever you grow up. And I thought, woman, have you got a, the wrong guy picked for that, uh, for that job? And, you know, it's interesting how God worked that all out. But the idea of minister here is not the idea of, you know, person who is the pastor of a church. That's not what he's referring to. The idea of ministering here, let's turn over, if you would, to the book of uh, Romans chapter uh, 13. Romans chapter 13. 
And uh, the concept, the word, the thought here for, uh, for minister is, uh, is pretty interesting. He said, uh, let's start reading in verse 1, Romans chapter, Romans chapter 13 and verse 1. And Paul says, let every soul be subject unto higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that are, are ordained of God. Okay, so he says the only authorities in this world are authorities because God has ordained them to be the authorities. Whoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive themselves judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the powers? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise unto the same. And, you know, people talk about, you know, you have policemen and you have army and those kind of things. And the idea of them being here on this earth is, you know, they are... Uh, ordained of God to have this power to, you know, to keep, uh, uh, you know, civilizations uh, acting properly and doing the things that are right and doing the things that are, that are good. And that's what he's talking about here. Verse number four says, he says, for he is a minister of God to thee for good. Okay. So here he's talking about, you know, somebody who does something, somebody who serves in a particular capacity or a particular way for the good of, you know, society for the good of mankind, for the good of things that are do, going, uh, going on in the world. And that's the word that we see back in the book of, of Philippians. You know, he's talking about, you know, somebody, not necessarily somebody who is a, a pastor of a church, but he's talking about somebody who is a minister, somebody who is, who is serving and usually serving because they have a desire to and they want the best for the people that they're serving, okay? So he goes back to, uh, go back to Philippians again, if you would, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 25. He says, but he is your messenger and the he that ministered to my need. OK, now, why do you think that Epaphroditus said uh, whenever they had the church meeting and said, who's going to go and take this gift to Paul? And Epaphroditus says, I'll be the one. I'll do it. Now, do you think he wanted to do that because he needed some time off work? Well, we don't know. You think he wanted to go there because he'd never been to Rome and he thought, boy, this would be fun. I could go up to Rome and, and uh, you know, I heard they have some really good eating places there and, you know, I'd like to go and visit those, uh, those eating places. Well, we don't know that. But do you think he did this because uh, uh, he just liked Paul? Paul was a good guy. Well, maybe a possibility. But we know for sure that he went there because he wanted to serve. He wanted to minister. Now, think about this for a second. Anytime we serve and anytime we minister, it costs us something. Anytime you serve, anytime I serve, anytime you minister, anytime I minister, it costs us something. It costs us time. It costs us money. It costs us work. Ministering is giving of the things that you have so that somebody else can profit from it. Somebody else can benefit from it. Somebody, so you can be a blessing to another person. That's the idea of ministering. It's not about me and what I get out of it. And, and sometimes, you know, whenever you do, uh, you know, minister to something, you know, God gives you a blessing and God gives you some encouragement and, and God ministers to you in a, in a totally different way. That certainly happens. But the desire of our hearts should be whenever we're ministering is I want to, you know, to give of myself so that somebody else can be blessed. I want to give of myself so that somebody else can be encouraged or I want to give of myself so that somebody else can be saved. And that's the idea of ministering. OK, and being a part of a church is being the part of and that's why they call a church a ministry of giving and sacrificing so that other people can hear the gospel, so that other people can grow in their relationship with God. You know, you think about uh, I think back over the uh, years that I have been in, uh, involved in ministry and I have seen so many people that have just given of themselves over and over and over and over and over again. And, you know, there's lots of people here that do the same thing, giving themselves over and over again so that some little kid can grow and develop in their relationship with God, so that some adult can hear the gospel, so that, uh, you know, some other person can grow in their relationship with God. And those things happen because that's the way God set it up. God set us up so that we can be, or the church set up the church of Jesus Christ so that we can minister to the needs of people around us. And here's Epaphroditus. You know, Paul was sort of writing out a, you know, an awesome uh, reference letter here, if we could say that. He says, you know, here's Epaphroditus. 
Epaphroditus is what kind of a guy? He says he's a, a brother. He cares about what's going on with his brothers and sisters in Christ. How about us? Do we care what goes on with our brothers and sisters in Christ? He's a co-laborer. He gets in there shoulder to shoulder and he works in ministry. He works in ministry projects. And again, all of us don't have the same kind of gifts and abilities as far as ministry go. But God wants all of us to use the talents, the gifts and abilities that we have in some way so that the church of Jesus Christ can benefit. The church is not made up of people who sit in the pew and don't do anything. Because then what would get done? Nothing. The church is made up of people that are workers, people that are desirous to, to, to labor together for the good of the testimony of Jesus Christ. Not only is he a co-worker, but he's also a co-laborer. Excuse me. Also a, a, a person who is a, a good soldier, a fellow soldier. Are we in the battle? Do we recognize what's going on in the battle and the things that are, that, are, that are taking place? And we need to have our eyes open to that. He's also your messenger and he's a minister to your need. Now, let's go on and see Epaphroditus' heart. Okay, verse number 20, uh, 26. He says, For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because you have heard that he had been sick. Now, isn't that interesting? He says, he longed after you all, and he was full of heaviness because you heard that he had been sick, okay? Because he knew what was the response of the people back home. How are they going to feel about his sickness? How are they going to feel about, uh, you know, him going up the, to Rome and getting sick? And apparently he was very sick because we'll see that as we, as we go along. And he says, you know, I was just so burdened. I was just so uh, taken back because you heard about uh, me being sick and I knew how you're going to feel. You're going to be upset. You're going to be, you know, sort of traumatized over the fact that, oh, no, Epaphroditus went up there and, and now he's sick. And, oh, it's just heavy. Heavy, uh, heaviness of their heart, and they were, they were upset about that. He says, for he longed after you all. And again, he didn't say, man, I went up there and I was sick, and man, was I ever mad because I got sick up there, or, or was I ever upset over the fact that, you know, here I am trying to serve God, and all I got was sick. No, that wasn't his attitude at all. He was upset because he knew that the people back home who loved, who cared about him, who were part of his body, the brothers and sisters that he left back there, he knew that they would have heaviness of heart. And he didn't want that for them. He didn't want them to be upset. And so he says, you know, I'm just full of heaviness because of that. Verse number 27. He says, for indeed he was sick near unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Now, interesting side note to this, uh, to this verse here. He says, uh, Epaphroditus was sick near unto death, and God had mercy on him. Now, it's interesting here that Paul doesn't say anything at all about him healing him. You know, laying hands on him, praying over him, any of those kind of things. All he says is that God had mercy on him. So it seems like it was, you know, more of a, a natural healing kind of thing that we would, uh, you know, that we would do here today. You know, if somebody is sick here, we would, we would pray, we would ask God to, uh, to heal them. It doesn't seem like, you know, Paul was using, and we know that other places Paul had healed people, but it doesn't seem like that was taking place uh, here. And he goes on and he says, but God had mercy on him. And not only did he have mercy on him, but he also had mercy on Paul because Paul didn't want to have sorrow upon sorrow. The sorrow of being in jail and then the sorrow of this one who uh, ministered to him, who cared for him, that he was sick and he died. He said, you know, that would just been, you know, too much for me. That would have been, you know, sorrow upon the sorrow that I already, uh, already have. And so, you know, God was merciful. And again, you know, we see the God granting, God giving us what we don't deserve, holding back the, uh, the judgment that we do uh, deserve. And so he says that he saw God's mercy there. Verse number 28, he says... I sent him, therefore, the more eagerly that when you see him again, okay, so he was near unto death. I sent him, therefore, the more eagerly. Uh, the word eagerly there says, you know, is the idea of more quickly. Uh, it's the word spudazzo. You know, I did it diligently, uh, quickly. I sent him to you. So as soon as he got better, Paul didn't have him hanging around Rome and working with him and doing ministry with him. He sent him right back to Philippi. Why? Because he knew that the people were worried about him. He knew that there was a concern about his health, and he wanted him to get back to 
uh, you know, his church, his family, his life that is, uh, that is there. He said, I sent him there the more eagerly. And when you see him again, now I think this is really interesting, the, the last part of this uh, passage of scripture, and how he tells them to receive Epaphroditus, okay? So probably what took place here is the Apostle Paul wrote this, uh, this letter or had somebody r- help him write this letter that he sealed the, the letter up and put a seal on it, gave it to Epaphroditus and said, take this back with you and read this at the church, Okay, probably what, uh, what transpired. Now, I don't, that's not inspired, that words I just said. That's probably what took place, that he's giving them this, uh, this letter. So he gets back there. They're reading through this letter. And he says, I send him, therefore, the more eagerly, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and that I may be less sorrowful. Okay. Now, obviously, whenever he came back, what were the people going to uh, say at the church? You know, the first, first Sunday back after being on a long trip like that, what are they going to say? Oh, you again? No, they're going to be excited. Say, wow, look at this. Epaphroditus is back. You know, tell us what's going on. You know, what's Rome like and what's Paul doing and, and how's the ministry going? And you know, they're going all, you know how it is when somebody you haven't seen for a long time. You see him, you have a million questions for him. You're all excited about seeing him again. And so you're rejoicing, you know, you're full of gladness because this, this brother whom we have sent on this trip to take the gift he has now come back and we're able to see him. And they're all excited about this. He says, he says that I may be less sorrowful. He says that I'm not concerned. I'm not worried about the fact that he has gone back to you. Now notice what the next verse says. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation. And I thought, what an interesting way to say that. He says, hold him such in in reputation. And the idea there, or another way to translate that word reputation there, is to hold him in in honor. You know, hold him up as as somebody who has been faithful in in service to God. Somebody who who has given their their all for for God. Somebody who is willing to, you know, to be spent and uh, to spend and be spent for the work of uh, the work of God. You know, hold him up as somebody who is, you know, a model as a Christian. In your, in your church because, you know, all the ministry that he has gone through, all the suffering he's gone through, his time and his abilities, you know, the things that he has used for the work of God. He says, hold him up, hold him in honor. And I think, you know, that's a good thing for us to, to think about, that we have somebody in our church, somebody who is in our ministry, somebody that we have been, uh, that has been faithful to serve God and walk with God and, and minister for God and, and do the, the work of God for a period of time or a long period of time. We hold them up in honor and say, you know, I want to be like them. You know, it's just, just great to see the ministry that they have been involved in. And, you know, if I could just sort of model myself after something like that. And that's the idea. That's the picture here that he's saying. Hold him up in honor. Hold him up in a place of, of uh, uh, service that is, that is special. Notice what he says in verse 30. Why would we hold him in honor? Because, because for the work of Christ, he was near unto death. Not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service towards me. Why would you hold him in honor? Because he was willing to do what? He was willing to give his life to do this work of ministry that that you guys sent him on. He was willing to give his life so that this gift could be given to me. He was willing to put it all on the line. Now, think about that for a second. What is it that you're willing to give your life for? Whatever you're willing to give your life for, it's got to really be important because you only get one life. You only have one opportunity. It's sort of like the, uh, you know, the, the pig and the, and the chicken got together one day and they said, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's make a special meal for the farmer. You know, he really takes good care of us. And he said, wow, let's, let's do that. You know, let's, let's make him breakfast. You know, we could, uh, chicken said to the pig, he said, uh, you know, we could, give him, uh, we could give him ham and eggs for breakfast. And the pig looked at the uh, chicken. He said, well, that's easy enough for you. All you got to do is give him a a couple of eggs. But for me, it's a total commitment. I thought you would like that one better than that. I'm a little. (laughs) But notice the point. He was willing to put his life on the line in service for the Lord. 
And again, when you stop and you think, what is it that I'm willing to put my life on the line for? What is it that I'm willing to, to give everything for? Am I willing to give everything for this thing that we call the church of Jesus Christ? Or I just sit and step back and, and look and wait for somebody else to do and somebody else to be involved. And I'll tell you, beloved, I think that the church, I know that the church of Jesus Christ is the way that God is working in the world today. And you and I need to be a part of that. We need to be the brothers and sisters, and we need to be uh, the fellow soldiers, and we need to be the co-laborers, and we need to be the ministers, and we need to do those things as a, an example that Epaphroditus had set forth to us to, to be, and that we would use our lives to, uh, to get that. There's many different ministries in the church, in the church of Jesus Christ, whether it's Community Baptist Church or any other church around the world, many different ministries the question is not how many ministries they have, is what ministries am I a part of? What am I involved in? What am I giving my life, my time, my talents? What am I, what am I pouring myself into? Like Paphroditus did. What am I giving myself so that I can be that honored servant? Jimmy Elliott, the wonderful missionary who died down in South America years ago made this statement. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He's no fool to serve and give your life because you can't keep your life. God has your life in your hands. He's no fool who gives his life to get what he cannot gain. He says, to keep, let me read that again. He's no fool who gives what he cannot keep. You cannot keep your life here on this earth. It is only here for a period of time. And what are you going to use it for? Accumulating things, sitting on the bench and watching? Or you want to be like Epaphroditus, who is willing to give everything that he had so that the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ could go forward for him? so that you can gain the things that you cannot keep, eternal rewards and glory. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we love you and praise you and thank you this day for the opportunity to think about this man that you used in a tremendous way many years ago. Thank you that he, God, was faithful to you. And I pray, God, that we, as we contemplate, think about, meditate upon the things that he was involved in, we would ask ourselves a question, Lord, what is my part in the body of Christ? What am I doing to help people get saved? What am I doing to help people grow? What am I doing to help to worship you, dear God? And Father, if you, speaking to souls, speaking to hearts, convict us, Lord, of what we need to change so that we can be effective in your ministry here in Rochester, New Hampshire. Use us, God. Help the church to grow and move forward for Jesus Christ's sake. We pray in his name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our invitation hymn, number 319, the first verse of Just As I Am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Amen. Please be seated. Just a few announcements this morning. Uh, the first one is the ladies' tea, so don't forget that. Next Saturday is the ladies' tea. The sign-up sheet on the bulletin board, ladies, if you have not signed up to either do a table or attend, please make sure your name is on those lists because they will be coming down after the service this morning. So be sure you get your name up on the 
on those lists. Also on the back table by the doors are cards for our missionaries and shut-ins. If you have not had the opportunity to write a little note or to sign your name to those cards, please do that on the way out as well. Uh, we do have the agenda for the business meeting. We have set a date for December 12th after the morning service for our semi-annual business meeting. Uh, the agenda is on the bulletin board. Um, so please make a note of that, that um, after the morning service, we'll need a quorum to conduct our meeting. So if you members, please make yourself available to that. Um, we are going to be starting up Sunday school at the first of the year. We have had a sign-up sheet, so all classes have had teachers sign up. Uh, so we have teachers for all the classes. Uh, so we're thinking at the first of the year, we're going to start our Sunday school program again. And we're going to start Sunday school at 10 a.m. So at this time that we've been coming for our morning service, we're going to start our Sunday school program. And then Sunday school will end around 9 or 1040 and we'll have our morning service at 11. So from 10 to 1040 for Sunday school, 11 to noon for our services. And that will start the first Sunday in January, which I believe is the second, January 2nd. So we'll put that in the bulletin, um, keep making uh, notes of that. And I'm also thinking uh, that we'll need to distribute the Sunday school material. We've got that in. Um, so probably next Sunday we'll break all that apart and uh, be passing out the materials to the teachers that have signed up. So we have teachers for all the grades again. Uh, so just keep that in prayer and in mind that we're going to have our Sunday school program back. So slowly but surely, we're getting everything started back up. We're also thinking about a installation service for Chris Williams. So we're thinking uh, the Saturday before his first service, he, he is going to preach January 9th. Uh, so we're looking at January 8th to have an installation service for him. Um, we're uh, inquiring about uh, someone who could preach that service for us. Um, so once, when we get some more details and button down some more information, uh, but I just wanted you to know to put it on your calendar that uh, Saturday, January 8th, if we can possibly do that, we're gonna have an installation service for our new pastor be able to welcome him. And that is all I have. So let's stand and be dismissed. I'd like to ask Trevor if he dismisses in prayer, please. Our Heavenly Father, uh, we're so thankful for um, all that you've done in our life, and all that you continue to do, and all the promises that you've given us uh, to be able to look forward to um, in the Bible. Lord, we thank you for the message that we heard this morning, I pray that you would help us to be um, active um, and not reactive, that we would be doing the things that we need to be doing um, to minister uh, to others around us and reach out to our community. I pray that you'd help us to be the salt and light that we need to be, to have the testimony that we need to be, to be effective in serving you. Um, we pray that you'd be with all those who are um, sick or under the weather now. I just pray that you'd watch over them and just help them uh, to heal, be able to make it back into church soon, and I pray that you would watch over us during these holidays, that you keep us um, focused on uh, you, the eternal mindset, not just um, the earthly things that we can get caught up in. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.